Okay, well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric O'Shaughnessy. I'm a research affiliate at the Berkeley Lab. Uh, and today, the excuse for today is a study we recently published, but really that's just an excuse to have a bigger conversation. So I'm, I'm really happy that we will have this panel discussion featuring some researchers from the Berkeley Lab, as well as University of California, Santa Barbara, University of Michigan, and Vote Solar. Uh, so, the agenda here will be about 15 minutes on a presentation of our recent work. Uh, then I'll hand it over for about 15 minutes to our colleagues at University of California, Santa Barbara. And then the remainder of the time will be a panel discussion led by Sarah Mills from the University of Michigan. Two kind of logistical items. First, this will be recorded uh, and, and posted. And second, we don't have a dedicated time for Q&A. Uh, but I still encourage you to, if you have thoughts, questions that occur to you on the fly, use the, the chat function or the Q&A function. After my first, first 15 minutes, I'll be able to, to chat over the, on, on the chat function, answer questions on the go. And if there are particular questions that come up that just really, really need to be addressed, uh, we can bring them up in the panel discussion. So with that, uh, I'll get to, to my portion of the of the presentation today. Uh, it's on this, this paper we recently published in the Journal of Environmental Policy and Planning. You can find it at this title. Uh, there's also a link to a public preprint open access in the email, which most folks should have seen this uh, webinar in. Flash a quick disclaimer at you and then get into it. So an overview of what this is all about. Uh, and then I'll, I'll get into the details. So the fact is to decarbonize the grid will require rapid large scale solar and wind project development, meaning that a lot of projects need to go somewhere. And this is raising questions of energy justice. And energy justice uh, is a big term at this point. A lot of people are, are learning more about it, uh, myself included. Uh, so we'll, we won't get too much into definitions uh, but typically, just know here, we're mostly talking about what might be called distributive justice, how the benefits and costs of the energy system are distributed. So it's kind of a small piece of a bigger framework of energy justice. Um, and the, the kind of the key framework here is that the justice implications of project siting are going to depend on where these projects are located. So we take a higher level question and just ask what is driving those location patterns. What is driving project siting patterns for utility scale solar and wind? Our main conclusion is that siting patterns are driven by techno-economic factors. So to the extent that there are demographic correlations, those are secondary to techno-economic factors, meaning things like solar insulation, wind speeds, and the need to access large open undeveloped spaces. Uh, these economic factors nonetheless do drive projects into areas with particular demographic characteristics, mostly meaning sparsely populated rural areas and to a lesser extent, low income areas, primarily because rural areas tend to be lower income. So let's dive a bit more into the weeds. The background here, there is plenty of land available. The actual amount of land is not a constraint. This graphic is from a Department of Energy study from last year, and you see that little solar block there. If you roughly double that to include wind, you can think that we're talking a surface area, something like that of the Great Lakes. So it's kind of a good visual to have in mind. It's a lot. It's a lot of land, but a lot of people point out it's nothing compared to urban spaces or disturbed areas, agriculture, etc. Nonetheless, even today, at very low levels of renewable energy penetration, we're already seeing a lot of local opposition. And this is somewhat of a paradox because survey after survey show that there is broad public support for renewable energy, but at a local level, it is difficult to find host communities that are willing to, or communities that are willing to host these projects. And that willingness is important. Uh, to some extent, for a project to be successful, there needs to be community acceptance or at the very least, a lack of active resistance. So if there's a lot of local resistance that can kill projects, it can delay them inevitably. So this question comes up about what communities 
are going to eventually host all of these large scale solar and wind projects. And this is where some of the justice implications and justice concerns come in. If solar and wind are being kicked around like a hot potato, there is of course the risk that that hot potato will end up uh, in the disadvantaged communities that have the fewest resources to oppose local projects. But if you look into the literature, it's not exactly that clear. There is no real consensus on uh, even the project level implications of, of project development. Any sort of large scale construction project is going to have some externalities. Uh, there is some degree of, of local cost, uh, but there's also a lot of benefits. So in a really simplistic sense, uh, a lot of the literature is split into these two camps. On one end are papers and studies that look at the burdens of solar and wind project development. And then from that conclude, well, if uh, solar and wind projects are disproportionately cited in disadvantaged communities, uh, that could disproportionately burden those communities with solar and wind project development. At the opposite end uh, are folks that argue that this is actually an opportunity. Renewable energy project development could be a boon. Uh, tax revenues, lease revenues, local temporary job opportunities. This could be a big benefit. And if projects are in fact cited in disadvantaged communities, it could be a great opportunity for economic development and community empowerment. Somewhere in the middle is, is one that's less discussed, uh, but at an aggregate level, there's possibility that project siting is actually neutral from a justice perspective. Uh, there's some survey work suggesting that people, a lot of individuals uh, think that from a justice perspective, what really matters isn't where projects are located, but rather the scale and pace of project siting or project development deployment. And this makes some sense because disadvantaged communities stand to bear the worst impacts of climate change. So if we can simply site projects as quickly as possible and, there, and thus mitigate climate change, those benefits will primarily accrue to disadvantaged communities. So the point here is not that we don't take any of these stances. We, we throw these out there, we discuss them in the paper, and in this framework, we say, well, if you really want, before you even think about what the energy justice implications of project siting are, you're going to need to know, are projects in fact disproportionately siting in certain areas? Uh, before we even think about, are they burden or boon? We need to know where these projects are. So that's what we do. We take a step back and just ask, what is really driving project siting? And if we can understand historical siting patterns, we'll have a good sense uh, for where future projects may be developed, and then be able to ask additional questions about the justice and equity implications of project siting patterns. So in some way, uh, I've said many times about this study, we ask about as many questions as we answer in the study. Uh, we get to a point and then set up future work. So the question we ask is simply, what is driving project siting? And then set up for future research and our, our panel discussion is, is uh, really an outcome of that, that we pose a lot of questions that maybe we'll get into a bit in the discussion. Uh, I'm not gonna do any methodological details here. Uh, all those are available in the study. If anyone has any questions I could clear up right now, I can answer them in the chat. But let's just dive into some of the, the really high level results from the study. So I'm gonna go through a series of plots uh, that all show the same thing. Uh, on the left, these are census tract level data. So on the left are census tracts with the lowest values of these variables. And on the right are census tracts with the highest values. So resource quality, this means solar insulation, the strength of sunlight and wind speed. And really intuitively what we see are that solar and wind projects are primarily locating in census tracts with the strongest resources the sunniest census tracts, the windiest census tracts. Totally intuitive. Land value, we see an inverse correlation. So some preference, not quite as strong as resource uh, for census tracts with cheap land. Again, makes sense. Transmission distance, there isn't really, that's the distance from transmission infrastructure. Not a really strong relationship. I'm not going to explain why uh, we get into that in the paper, uh, but it's not really relevant for the discussion we'll have today. And then an interesting one is 
distance from protected areas. These are cultural, recreational, protected areas. Uh, Sornman projects tend to avoid census tracts that have protected areas. We include that as an epic proxy for local opposition. Presumably, developers are avoiding those areas to avoid lots of strong local opposition. Looking at some land uses, uh, probably the, the clearest correlation, and these are all just correlations, we're not controlling for anything yet, uh, is with developed space. So a very strong preference to avoid census tracts with lots of developed areas. So uh, most solar and wind capacity is cited in the census tracts with the least developed space, so far from urban areas. To some extent, uh, a skew towards areas with agricultural, uh, mostly because these are, are areas with open space, but also because solar and wind can be compatible with agricultural land uses. And then finally, a uh, clear preference for areas with undeveloped open space. Lots of solar and wind in census tracts with undeveloped open space. Those were kind of the techno-economic factors, and it brings us to the kind of the, the crux of the study is, well, how do those explain or, or where solar projects are located, solar and wind projects are located uh, relative to demographic factors? We look at three. Uh, beginning on the left is income. And here I, I include fossil just for a, a comparison to understand how do solar and wind project siting patterns compared to those of the existing energy system. Um, so looking on the left with income, uh, solar and wind and fossil all tend to avoid high income tracks at similar levels. And I phrase it like that because if you look at the first three quartiles, there's no real pattern. Uh, the only one where a clear pattern is, is marked uh, is the fact that there is tends to be very few, very little solar, wind, and fossil capacity in the highest income census tracts. Uh, with minority, so this is percent of the population that self-identifies as a minority, solar and wind have two totally different relationships. So because solar can be sited on rooftops, it can be sited on relatively small lots, solar is still a rural resource but less so than wind. Solar can be sited in urban spaces, semi-urban spaces, whereas wind really needs open space. Wind is usually not viable in urban areas or the urban fringe. So for that reason, wind with respect to minority populations looks a lot more like fossil, whereas solar does have some siting relationship with census tracts with larger minority populations. And then finally, in terms of population density, um, all three resources are similar, showing clear preferences for sparsely populated areas, but fossil less so, which is an important point that I'll close on. So again, all of those were correlations. Uh, they did not control for potentially confounding factors. The main results of our paper are summarized here. This is a multivariate model, so controlling for multiple factors all at the same time. And the picture that emerges here is that solar and wind project siting are really primarily driven by three factors, three related factors. Uh, first and foremost is the resource. So again, solar insulation, wind speeds, particularly in the case of wind. Uh, second is the need for open, undeveloped spaces. And the third is sparsely populated areas. So those three. And if you look at the demographic factors, income is not really one controlling for their factors. There's not a strong correlation with income levels uh, or minority population levels, which is to say that solar and wind projects are primarily driven by techno-economic factors, and any correlation with demographic factors are secondary. That said, the techno-economic factors do drive projects into communities with particular demographic characteristics. So these plots essentially predict the characteristics of a typical host track based on the multivariate model. What we see and compare it to fossil, what we see is that solar and wind both uh, tend to site in somewhat lower income tracks, not substantial, but it's there. 
Uh, in terms of minority populations, solar looks similar to fossil for the reason that I said that both solar and fossil tend to be semi-urban resources. Solar can site in urban fringes as does fossil, whereas wind is a predominantly rural resource where minority populations tend to be smaller. And then in terms of population density, both solar and wind clear skews towards areas with sparsely populated uh, versus fossil, which can site closer to an urban fringe. So the implications of this um, is what we leave with the question mark. <laughs> we close the study posing questions for further research. Uh, and if you think about it, it really depends on this question of are solar and wind projects a net burden, a net boon, or is project siting neutral from an energy justice perspective? As is almost always the case with research, we conclude it's more nuanced than that. It's clearly site specific and contextual. Uh, and we get a bit into that discussion in the paper, and we'll certainly unpack that more uh, in the panel discussion. Uh, so like I said, if, if folks do have questions on this particular, uh, we'll, we'll chat in the, the Q&A or the, the chat box. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll pass it off to Grace and the folks at UCSB. Hey, thanks, Eric. Let me, can I start sharing my screen? Yeah, I think you just share. You should kick me off. I'll, I'll stop sharing in case. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Grace Wu. I am currently an assistant professor in the environmental studies program at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, um, Dr. Ranjit Deshmukh. Um, Ranjit, do you want to um, just introduce yourself so people can see you? Sure. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the environmental studies department, as well as the Brent School of Environmental Science and Management. I'm also a faculty scientist in the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and Grace will be leading this presentation. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna present some uh, nearly complete, but still very much an ongoing project. Um, it, it is very much a collaborative study. Um, I have my collaborators listed on the, on the right-hand side. Um, they are recent graduates of um, the Bren School's uh, Masters of uh, Environmental Data Science program. Um, and I work very closely with the Nature Conservancy um, scientists and use uh, a lot of their data outputs um, in this work. And I want to um, just acknowledge um, the very helpful input that the LBL team, um, including Eric, all the co-authors um, on the recently published paper, they've provided uh, to our work throughout uh, from the beginning and, and very recently. So um, thank you for that. So uh, I won't provide a lot of the motivation and background. Um, I think Eric did a great job teeing that up for both the panel discussion and I think also provide providing that socioeconomic and equity motivation uh, for this type of analysis. So we um, started this project with a fairly similar um, set of objectives. The uh, sort of the broadest objective being what explains uh, utility scale wind and solar siting in the US. Um, and I think what perhaps distinguishes the study or um, takes it one step further is we look um, also at the geographic variation of those siting factors. Um, we were motivated both, I mean, by the understanding of these trends, but we wanted to also uh, develop an approach that would allow us to predict areas of likely future development so that we can assess the future impacts, the environmental and social impacts under some kind of BAU trajectory of utility scale development. Um, and we wanna use those anticipated impacts to inform the design of a more equitable and, and lower environmental impact solar build out and wind build out. So um, I'm only going to gloss over some of the details of the approach, um, but I think it's important to uh, at least provide a little bit of an overview um, simply because 
um, then we can understand some of the differences between the approaches that drive the differences in the results. So we examined a, a fairly large suite of predictor variables ranging from environmental sensitivity, land cost, uh, distances to important infrastructure, um, capacity factor, which is a, a proxy for windy areas and sunny areas. Um, it, we included a um, policy or political favorability um, proxy in the form of a renewable portfolio standard. Um, and we also included a couple of social factors. So we included the um, social vulnerability index um, that's created by the CDC, um, and, as well as the census uh, track level unemployment data. Uh, we have two specific geographic components to the work. We included regional variables, so we divide, subdivided the um, coterminous U.S. into five just regions, included that as variables in the approach, and we also uh, took a distinct geographic approach um, called a geographically weighted regression, and you'll see some of the results of that. Um, and finally, we uh, took this, we call a multi-model approach. Um, we were really, um, as part of this understanding plus prediction process, we were looking for a model that would yield the best predictor prediction. Um, so we tested these four statistical and machine learning models. Um, and then the results I'll show kind of aggregate or provide the ensemble results uh, of these four approaches. So I just want to quickly go over some of the key assumptions. We only looked at utility scale wind and solar um, greater than 20 megawatts. We only looked at more recent projects built in the last four years um, in or after 2018. And this is primarily in order to align the presence of these projects with the um, temporal snapshots. That's the nature of these predictor variable data sets, including the um, substation and transmission lines. We looked at pre project presence or absence, um, and we created these absences based on what we call pseudo absence locations. Um, and the figure on the right will kind of provide a little more detail as what I mean by pseudo absence. So these are the presence locations that meet the first two criteria, size and um, time that it was built. We then subsetted the US to areas that are we deem suitable areas for development. These are based on industry standards for what is technically and um, physically feasible for solar development. And we exclude areas that um, are legally protected for environmental reasons. And then within that, we did a random sample to create these pseudo absence locations. So areas that we think are suitable for wind and solar development, but just don't have any projects currently. So we excluded the presence. So we put that into these four models. Um, and I just wanna quickly, without getting into details, um, say that the model performance actually was very similar for wind, um, but these this both the statistical machine learning approaches yielded the best uh, predictions, but again, they're all very similar. There's a wider range for solar. Um, again, the random forest per, per, um, performed the best, Lasso and Maxent, um, and the logistic regression, which I'll show the results of, um, which is similar to the LVL approach so that we can um, see a, a, a comparison across those two studies. Okay, so these are the logistic regression results. These are kind of your um, uh, standard statistical results, you can interpret them in terms of like p-values and, and um, their significance. Um, so these are the predictor variables that I mentioned a few slides ago. Um, and then the number of stars or asterisks indicate the degree to which they're important um, in, in explaining the variability in the model. So for wind, um, we see that the most important variables for explaining the presence and, or absence of wind farm is uh, distance or include distance to substation and transmission. So there's a negative correlation. So the shorter the distance, the more likely we are to see a wind project, which makes a lot of sense. Um, capacity factor, which I mentioned earlier, is a proxy for how windy the area is. 
we see a very strong positive correlation, which we expect um, also based on Eric's presentation that te these techno-economic factors drive um, these citing outcomes. And we also see that there's a role for policy that RPS standards are also very highly correlated um, with presence of wind. We see a, all, a statistically significant outcome for both environmental and social and, and just for unemployment here. Um, they're not as strongly correlated as those techno-economic, um, but they reinforce um, the LBL study that you know these are important, but they're secondary to those techno-economic. For solar, we find that um, there is an overlapping but uh, differing set of variables that drive solar siting. Land acquisition costs and population density are the two that stand out compared to wind. Um, and uh, interestingly, we find that there is a positive correlation. So the higher the population density, the higher the likelihood of seeing solar. And we can talk a little more about why that seems to be a contradiction. Um, uh, with what you would expect. And then there's also the land acquisition cost. So higher the land acquisition cost, the higher the likelihood of solar. Um, and then the distances to transmission kind of a, reinforce um, what we expect with wind, as do the capacity factor. So the technical potential and the policy. But we don't see um, uh, any kind of impact like poor, strong correlation with the social factors. So these are the wind prediction maps for two of the models that um, yielded the best outcomes. Uh, this is the random forest and lasso. As you can see, they very much agree with each other. The green areas indicating the higher probability of a wind farm being sited in that area. Um, and I, have this little thumbnail of capacity factor map. So capacity factor is basically, as I said, which areas are the windiest in the US can generate the most electricity uh, per wind farm. We can see that uh, there's a very strong correlation between the capacity factor and both of these model prediction outcomes. Um, but, uh, but it is very much a subset of that. So even within very windy areas, there are areas that the model predicts are very unlikely to see wind. Um, development due to the many other factors that we've um, found were important. These are the solar prediction maps. So um, they're very similar, even though the performance diverged more significantly across the models for solar. We do see a lot of predicted development across the eastern and western seaboard and then smatterings um, throughout the Midwest and, and uh, southwest and southeast. Um, there is this distinct kind of uh, carve out in California, Nevada and the random forest because the random forest model deemed uh, the RPS variable to be very important. And so those two states have uh, one of the highest near term RPSs. Finally, we looked at um, how factor importance varies geographically. So here are some maps that show um, that the correlation of these variables, even though we showed the global uh, positive or negative correlation and their relative importance, this shows that regionally, the impact of those variables actually vary significantly. So um, just to provide kind of intu a intuitive um, example, with unemployment, we see that um, there's a very strong positive correlation between rate of unemployment and the, um, um, the likelihood of seeing a wind farm. And so we see that's very positive in this area of Texas, um, but very negatively correlated elsewhere other than in the Great Lakes. And it, for environmental exclusions, we find that it's very positively correlated, uh, I'm sorry, that there's a very high likelihood of seeing a wind farm in an area that has high environmental impact in this green region. And a negative correlation in this area of the Northwest, uh, Pacific Northwest and, and the New England and Eastern area. So there seems to be different trends across the US depending on the particular siting factor. And this is a couple of examples for solar uh, population density, 
is positively correlated higher population uh, more solar in these particular green areas and then it's negatively correlated elsewhere so this kind of suggests that a global model may not i mean global as in a national level model that expresses these trends may not really capture these regional differences and then finally i just want to summarize um, across these four tech uh, approaches um, what we kind of found were the most important the most common trends in explaining areas of uh, wind and solar development really roughly ranked by relative importance so we find capacity factor windier areas distance of transmission and substation a really strong rps near term target um, distance to road unemployment and then finally environmental sensitivity and we find that with some statistical approaches the regional differences were also really important solar projects um, have a smaller subset uh, we find that higher population density is strongly correlated um, and again rps we find um, and land acquisition costs and uh, shorter distance of transmission substation and road and again um, the regional variables were also um, statistically significant. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this work is very much um, still in progress. We are in the process of wrapping up the analysis and writing it up for, um, for peer review. Uh, there are some additional analyses we want to conduct um, to kind of explain some of those loose ends we want to include um, some individual socioeconomic dimensions because we didn't find um, any relationship or correlation with the social vulnerability index, which is an aggregate index, but looking at some of the variables that LBL um, included, like income, percent minority, or even um, including educational level. And then we can ex explore the geographic variation. Um, we can substitute RPS with a better renewable favorability index. Um, and then finally, we can also look at uh, drivers for the size of the plants as opposed to this binary presence or absence. Um, with that, I'm, can, I'm happy to hand it over to um, Sarah for the panel, but that pretty much wraps up the, our presentation. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions um, in the Q&A in chat directly. Great. Well, I first want to uh, thank um, both sets of presenters for really being clear. And also, let's do a time check. Amazingly staying on time. Excellent job, folks. Um, I was really, really, I'm Sarah Mills. I'm at the University of Michigan. And I was really, really excited to be asked to join the panel. Um, first, because I got a, a forcing me to read all the way through the paper. Um, but also because this is a, I think both papers address a question that I have been wondering about, about whether projects are, and what I get from talking to communities, why am I being targeted with this project? How much of the targeting is based on, you know, technical, technical factors and how much is based on the people that are there? Um, and so I think that both of them address that. I thought what I would start out with is just the notes that I jotted down in the course of this about where I see areas of agreement and disagreement and start by making sure that I'm getting it right. And then I'm really interested in diving, honestly, into the like, so what this means, what's next implications. What I saw was there's lots of commonalities, even though these papers seem to take different, you know, um, uh, different sets of uh, different statistical approaches to arrive at them. Um, also, I it seems to me that maybe using different, um, slightly different data in terms of the megawatt threshold, but I would love folk, uh, the two teams to verify or correct me there. Um, it seemed like the, the UCSB paper was like 20 megawatts threshold. I'm curious, LBNL, and that was also a question in chat about kind of what the, what the threshold is. Um, but also really start to tease apart. I would love your reactions. Like there are differences in the trans importance of transmission and, and proximity to transmission. And you guys have thoughts about why that is. Um, also, there appears to be differences that, um, Grace, you pointed out about population density and land acquisition costs for the solar side. And I like, I don't know, that's what I picked up on. But 
actually first maybe turning it over to folks from LBNL, like, does that sound right? <laughs> I don't know how much of a preview you had of the UCSB um, work, but like, um, yeah, can you read it? Were my, it was my overall summary of points of comparison and divergences appropriate? Yeah, yeah, so first on the question of scale, uh, I'm looking at the paper and I, I, I don't know if we have a firm cutoff. Uh, we described the data source in the paper, it's utility scale solar data and wind data compiled by the lab and USGS. Uh, it's definitely less than 20, uh, so it's, it's potentially smaller. And yes, there was a, a question in Q and A that I, I I misspoke a bit when I mentioned that solar can be an urban resource, and I, I think I, I might have said on rooftops. Yes, of course, solar can be installed on rooftops, uh, but not the solar in our data set. So, uh, if there are utility scale solar uh, in our data set, it's an urban ground mount or an urban fringe ground mount. So that that was a good point. Um, and then on some of the differences, so yeah, there's there's clearly uh, we, we've been talking to US, UCSB for several months now and, and looking at some of their results and sharing our own. And, and right, we, we click on most things. Uh, I am curious to hear a bit more about the population density on the solar that could be related to this geographic variation that Grace mentioned. Um, and then on really quickly with transmission, uh, I breezed over that, but essentially what we conclude is that Obviously, distance to transmission matters, uh, but below a certain point, it doesn't make or break um, a project. So as long as it's reasonably close, uh, I think the number we threw out in the paper was something like 80 kilometers, 50 miles, or, or something like that. Within that range, it doesn't really move a lot. So that's why it didn't end up being a big, big factor. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll pass it to Grace with a question of my own about that to unpack a bit more your thinking on the, the correlation with population density. And, um, and I do want to be sure at some point we'll invite the other panelists on. So uh, yeah, I'm assuming Sarah, you have a plan for when to do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to, I um, I agree with Mil, uh, with Sarah that this those are the areas that um, stood out as um, being in disagreement, um, but I, again, the methods are fairly different. We did a project by project analysis. We didn't aggregate at the census tract level. We didn't include all areas, like all census tracts. Um, we subset it to the, I think that the defining difference that may be driving this um, population density outcome is the fact that we really only uh, looked at absence locations from areas that are suitable for utility scale solar. So these excluded high density urban areas um, that we did not find like capability for installing 20 megawatt plants. And um, so we did not include this a, a, um, potential for urban infill. Um, we basically excluded medium to high density areas. So that may be what's that's my my best guess at what's driving that difference. Um, and that still leaves a lot of room for solar development, but that remaining room um, is really in, in a lot of that in, in areas that are low, have low population density. And we do find that there is higher likelihood of solar being developed closer to transmission that is closer to a more densely populated areas amidst the a uh, universe of possibilities for solar, which includes a lot of open space. Um, and with regards to, sorry, just so uh, an add to the substation, we did find, I didn't, I should have pointed this out, but there is a lot of heterogeneity in the distance to substation. There are areas, we find that areas in the, um, the Western states, especially in their mountain West and West and, and the coast uh, have a very high correlation with distance to population, uh, transmission and the uh, presence or absence of wind. So the uh, distances for the transmission line distances are just far greater in the Western states than they are in the Eastern. But on the whole, the global model is suggesting that there's a negative correlation, even though there's a lot of regional heterogeneity. And I noticed that kind of 
the regional differences are in the next steps for the LBNL paper too, um, in terms of digging about that, or um, at least there were more in the appendices, I think. Um, why don't uh, all of the panels go ahead and turn on your camera so we can have a conversation, but specifically next, it's not gonna be a full introduction. I'll let Brandy Hyatt uh, introduce herself by saying from Vote Solar introduce herself, but by saying, I'd love your take Brandy on like, what stood out to you in the presentations? So, and that will help, I think, maybe guide our conversation. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Brandy Hyatt, uh, she, they pronouns. I am the manager on our Access and Equity uh, team uh, for Vote Solar. And I think one of the biggest things that, that really jumped out to me was seeing the correlation between um, how many people, like density of people, and um, how many solar projects there are. Um, just given that solar is kind of one of these things that can fit into different areas in terms of like I think offshore you know like wind very much needs to be in a very specific area um and so for me I thought like seeing those numbers kind of just like really I guess re-emphasized some of our work um in terms of that both solar thinking about um ways that solar can can work uh, for low-income and uh, frontline communities knowing that there are areas within their own community that can they can be placed there but also realizing that it's one of those technologies that can kind of fit in multiple places so i felt like that was something that uh, really jumped out to me um i'd love to hear what other folks thought in terms of what jumped out to them but that was the first initial thing that uh that i thought great um, I'll also just throw out, I've got a list of a few questions here, um, but if folks in the audience have things that you want me to answer, put it in Q&A um, and we can weave it into the conversation. So one of the things that stood out to me was that I think within the literature, within the like social acceptance literature, there's a lot of discussion about justice and particularly distributional justice um, and as well as procedural justice. But my sense is that a lot of that is like intra-community between people like with the solar panels on their property or wind turbines on their property and then their neighbors. And I like that this takes a different view um, in thinking about intra-community <laughs> differences perhaps. Did that, I don't, I don't know. Is, did you, have you also, <laughs> maybe that's what inspired these, is that you saw that as lacking in the literature, um, but was that intentional? And then one, like, is, and is that a, a right take from my point, particularly um, thinking about kind of the, the census tracts or the, the unit of analysis, the geographic unit of analysis that each of your teams are using. So that's the first one. And then the follow-up question to that would be, how do you think that ought to inform when we're thinking about intra kind of community um, distribution too? So I don't know if which team wants to start or who wants to start that conversation. I guess I'm happy to jump in and at least kick things off. Um, I'm sure this will be a robust conversation, but yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with that characterization, just the, the unit of analysis, as you said, and the fact that we're looking here on a national scale um, uh, really kind of, I think, leads one to, to the kind of inter-community comparison rather than an intra-community. Now, you said in the social acceptance literature, there's been <clears throat> perhaps more focus on intra-community kind of justice differences or, um, or, or conflict. Um, I think that's probably true, but I think that's also largely true because we see a lot of case study research um, in the social acceptance literature. So I think looking um, you know, at a couple of case studies, maybe comparatively lends itself a little bit more to kind of digging into those intra-community details. And, and, and I guess the last thing I'll say is you know, just the whole framing that I think both Eric and Grace kind of put around these papers is like, you know, is it, it, are these wind and solar projects a net benefit, a net burden, or kind of net neutral? And when we say the word net, I think that allows us to understand that you know, within each of these hosting communities, you know, some individuals may be burdened and some individuals may be, you know, more benefited. Um, but really, the, this is a bigger question of kind of the net impact. And, and just to lay some cards on the table about the, one of the motivations for the study was certainly new policy approaches and thinking. Uh, the Justice 40 initiative being an example. 
So Justice 40 is defined by ensuring that 40% of the benefits of federal clean energy investments flow to disadvantaged communities. So it's by definition an inter-community question. It's about the distribution of benefits across communities rather than individuals within communities. So that was also part of the reason why we, we kind of took that inter-community perspective. Great. If I may, Brandy, do you wanna go ahead? <laughs> um, if I may just add, I mean, just to take you know one step back, I mean, these, um, the spatial analysis studies are, are great and we are trying to dig deeper into what the effects would be, but right now we can identify, okay, are the projects gonna be located in sort of low income or BIPOC communities? Um, but if they're located, what would be that effect is still sort of an open question, is it? If wind projects are located in these communities, how would that affect property values? And we have seen some research saying that property values actually go down. But then are we creating more jobs in those communities, which will then be a boon to those communities? So those, like digging deeper into those questions is so important to understand how these projects and their siting is actually gonna affect communities. Brandy, did you have something you wanted to add before? Uh, yeah, it was pretty similar um, in terms of just thinking through uh, how like once the actual um, project is in a community, what does that look like? Um, thinking about like the way in which it's financed, is there community ownership there? Um, also, like Ken mentioned, I know there, there are issues that come across with uh, solar jobs in particular. Um, are those long lasting? What does that look like? Um, what is the educational process for folks in the community if they do um, wanna you know, be a solar installer? Is there a pathway to becoming an engineer, you know, potentially making more money, maybe joining the union? So um, I think there's a lot of these other pieces that, that are really important once, not even just that, like if you put this thing here, does it do A or B? It's really like, if you put this thing here, A, B, C, D, E, like there, there's a lot of, uh, additional external things that um, you kind of have to think about and they do change and vary depending on what community um, it, you're deciding to put, you know, a project in. Um, so that was kind of another piece I was thinking about as well. So a couple of the questions that came in are the things that like really stood out to me and made me super excited for this panel. So like, I'm a transition folks, um, which is, I really want to dig into the like, is this a burden or a boon? Right. Like it, it, I, what I took away from this is that we're not targeting already kind of marginalized communities. Like there, there, there's not evidence from either study that, that that's underway. Um, that some of this is just it, things tend to go into places with low land value because that makes sense. Or, or if there are differences in terms of demographics, it's just because that correlates with. The places that are windy or low population density. So that's what I'm seeing, that it's not targeted. But it, whether these energy projects are a burden to a community or a benefit to a community is really important, I think, in terms of the policy and what you do <laughs> um, and how you, know, how you approach ensuring that the benefits are going to the Justice 40 or, or what this looks like for Justice 40 communities. Let's say that if it's a burden, I don't know that, that, that the, a burden of a project is the right approach. <laughs> um, I am, I think you both noted this and this is a question that came in Q&A and I'm sure, I just know your, all of your work on here, that you're thinking about this. How do, you, how do you get to that point? Like what's that next research project to figure out then? Like whether there are patterns and what, and what would you do to figure out are these projects a benefit or a burden, or is it neutral in terms of an equity perspective? Eric. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll start perhaps mostly just to nominate, uh, to maybe to prompt Joe to, to answer it, is that, so we we kind of, like I said, we, we end there and just pose that question. Um, I'm not really sure how, if there is a way to answer that question in the, in the net, in the aggregate, to simply say projects are a net boon or a burden. 
Uh, and I tend to be skeptical of any conclusion that makes broad sweeping claims across those lines. Um, the, the reason I was gonna maybe prompt Joe to talk about it is Joe does a lot more research in procedural justice, which is uh, I think what you're driving at a bit here and some of the questions in the, in the Q and A are about is determining if a project shifts towards burden or boon is not necessarily um, something inherent about the project. Oftentimes it has to do with how that project is received and described and offered and integrated into community, which is all aspects of procedural justice and, and LBL is doing some research on that. So I don't know if Joe, if you wanna mention that. Yeah, I will, I, I guess, yeah, kind of maybe just to agree with Eric broadly that you know, it, it, it's hard to make that distinction on net um, because I think the truth is, and I think probably all the panelists here would probably agree that it depends on a project by project and a site by site case. And I think one of the key distinctions that I wanna make is that, you know, there are factors that affect the justice outcome of a project that are both structural as in maybe they're like state level or even federal level regulations that are kind of baked into how these projects are you know developed and deployed but then there are also aspects of justice outcomes that are not structural perhaps but are more like implementational like how do developers and project owners and operators develop and operate these projects um, to be more or less just for their host communities. And, and because of those kind of variables, both kind of structurally and implementationally, you know, varying widely across the installed fleet of projects we see in the US, it depends. Um, and so even, and that's why I think case studies are kind of rich for kind of getting at, at this question and why it's, it's gonna be really hard to say on net, it's either A or B. Now, of course, that, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do the types of studies like, uh, you know, Ranjit was talking about national kind of level property value assessments. Um, LBL has led a few of those in the past and is continuing to, to kind of expand and improve that work. And it's really important to know, you know, overall, do we see kind of property value um, impacts from the development of wind and solar in host communities? Um, but at the same time, you have maybe you have property value impacts of, of very close residents. You also have kind of tax benefits um, throughout the county or throughout the community that um, could be, you know, capitalized into, into property values that are further away from those projects. And anyway, so it is kind of very complex and I think hard to, hard to uh, make a case on that. But just kind of transitioning really quick into the procedural aspects, certainly I think that's a case where it's Again, both structural and implementational, but um, you know it, th there is a strong need for communities to to have more of a say in the process. Um, that's going to lead to better outcomes, um, better perceptions toward the projects, but also just materially better outcomes um, for those hosting communities. And kind of moving away from, I guess what we typically call like a decide, announce, defend model of of developing projects, where the the developer comes in with the kind of decision already made and just has to get the leases signed and then it's a done deal um, and moving towards more, you know, something more um, where you consult with the community and kind of consider their inputs and then kind of modify your original proposal based on the community needs and values and, and then proceed. So I think we have a lot of work to do. Some developers perhaps are, are on that track, but um, that's definitely not, you know, business as usual. Um, so maybe we'll see that evolve over time. Other thoughts about gauging that, or kind of what leads communities to to respond to a project as a boon or a or a kind of um, a burden. So the comment that came in in the Q and A, I would just say that Joe and I and Ben Hone are on this working on this project together, along with others, trying to understand doing some of that case study to understand the process <laughs> and. Um, and for solar in particular, um, and to get at like, what were perceptions of the process? Like what did developers do right? What did local government officials do right? What's right in policy? Is there something about the design? So that's to, work in progress to be determined. With the five minutes that we have left, um, I'm wondering if we can just talk a little bit about, so what does this mean? <laughs> like, um, because we know that there are, um, that it's hard to make a carte blanche statement that like 
a renewables project is a benefit to a community. Like, of course, every community should want a renewables project. And also, we also know that this is not like the death knell for a community to have a project, right? That projects can be neutral. I'm wondering what it means for policy. So um, what can, like, how should what we're doing inform policy? And either thinking about like within um, the IRA kind of bill that's all, uh, all about, like DC is all abuzz about and kind of what the provisions are for the ITC, um, PTC kind of adders associated with naming specific kinds of communities where you can, you know, get an extra tax credit by citing in energy communities um, or state policy, because that actually came up, Grace, in your work as well. Um, so, so what do you think, what do you think, how do you think this research informs that or should inform that? Fran, did you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, I guess my, my first thought is really, I think this, this helps in terms of number one, realizing that um, citing is not this like, like you'd run a couple numbers and it's an EV fix, right? Like we're, we're realizing that like, even after this, there's still so many questions on, well, okay, this is this seems like it might work, but here's a gap here. And um, I think policy can also come into play in terms of number one, giving resources, right? Like, so if a community, you know, if someone from the community is here and they're like, wow, like solar can or wind can potentially, you know, be a boon for my community, what does that look like? Um, and maybe they read one to one of your case studies um, once they come out, um, they can look at these policies and see, okay, here is where we can grab funding from. Like we can grab it from a grant. Um, there's a low-income ITC. There, there are these options to get funding for communities, um, for low-income communities, for frontline communities, for communities of color who would be interested in changing, you know, moving off of fossil fuels and moving, you know, onto clean energy. Um, we look at countless different studies and you see that um, low-income folks, um, you think about Black folks, Indigenous folks, they either have higher energy burdens, they are closer to coal plants, to um, different types of fossil fuels. And so, um, number one, on the policy level, even if it's federal, which like, you know, fingers crossed um, on some of the federal stuff, um, but even on the state level, being able to have that access to funding um, through policy, I think is vital. Um, a lot of these communities are already underfunded. So being able to put funding into these things so that communities can engage more. Um, it's easy to engage in clean energy um, if you have the funding for it not so much if you don't. Um, so I think policy is a driver for that financial um, piece so that people can engage. Can't think about something if you don't have the funding for it. Grace, any thoughts on, or, or Ranjit on interaction with RPS? I mean, clearly what your research finds is it's important for driving deployment in those particular states, yeah? I don't wanna have the closing word. I would just say, uh, um, I would just say like in terms of citing authority, especially if there's a question about burden versus boon, I think that there's a movement in, at least in my part of the country to kind of take away local control. And I don't know that that's necessarily warranted or a great move personally. I don't have the, back, the data to back it up, but um, Grace, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I personal, citing is such a local decision, like citing outcomes are all local the policy drivers are very state level, as you, we saw. Um, the argument I've always made anytime I speak to a policymaker about citing decisions is we can incentivize better citing outcomes by planning a little more holistically. Currently, it's very project developer driven. And I am very aware of how it's happening in California. I'm not sure how extrapolatable that um, experience is to other states. Um, but California is currently on the cusp of trying to shape citing decisions based on where they're putting transmission um, and planning on a two-year cycle. And I think to answer, um, I think Jessica's question about maybe some citing requirements and planning processes that can shape more equitable outcomes, it's really through kind of an integrative resource planning framework where there are multiple stakeholders that get together doing regional and state level planning. And then there's a downscaling process 
where we consult with county and local communities and say, are these maps where we want to see energy development? If not, uh, where can we steer infra like ancillary infrastructure like substation upgrades um, and transmission extensions so that we can influence and, and um, you know, incentivize development areas or we do want to see them where communities are receptive. Thank you for being the last word on this. I don't know, Eric, Joe, if I was supposed to turn it over to you guys to final to, to give the final things, but I wanna thank all of you. I really appreciated learning um, the ins and outs of your papers. And thanks Brandy too, for putting this kind of in the context of um, the work that you are working on uh, doing too and understanding like how this can be useful. So thank you. Yeah, and thanks, Sarah. This was a lot of fun. Uh, I hope all the, the participants had enjoyed it. Uh, reach out to us with any questions, um, and we should do this more often. <laughs> Fun chat. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.